Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Vilma Arlotti. I am the marketing director for Limonas Medical. Uh, welcome to the Mastering Medical Treatment webinar. Uh, just wanted to let you know this event is brought to you by the Legal Lean Alliance. Lean on Us Medical, Doctors on Lean, Injury Institute. So thank you uh, to the Legal Lean Alliance for bringing us this webinar. Um, also, I wanted to make mention you will receive a follow-up email before this webinar ends, and uh, you can submit your questions and uh, let us know how everything went. Uh, our guest speakers for today are Dr. Justin Lowe, Pain Management Specialist in Northern California, Dr. Kenneth Light, Orthopedic Surgeon in Northern and Southern California, and Dr. Paul Elliott Hughes, Orthopedic Surgeon in Northern California. Welcome, Dr. Also, our moderator for today, uh, although she doesn't need any introduction because she's very well known, uh, the lovely Erica Chavez. Uh, is joining us today, and she is a personal injury attorney with BDNJ and founder of TBI Med Legal. Erica, take it away. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us on a lovely Tuesday afternoon. It feels like a Monday to me, though, because I wasn't in my office yesterday. Vilma, we were flying around yesterday making visits in Northern California. Dr. Lowe, we didn't make it to San Jose, but next time. I'm offended, but next time I'll hold you to it. Right. And so we've got Dr. Light with us, Dr. Lowe and Dr. Hughes, which I would say is like the trifecta of what you need in a case. Like you've got pain, you've got ortho spine, right? And now you've got your extremities, doctor. To me, this is absolutely like any case that comes in and a client's got shoulder pain, neck pain, hand pain, whatever they've got going on. You've got to get them to these types of practice areas. So I think we're in a really great spot to learn what each of you guys do. Shining, you've got some questions that people have sent in. Why don't we um, get through? Well, Vilma, you're, are you going to introduce the doctors or do I have the pleasure of talking about where they're from? Um, yes, I can introduce the doctors. I believe uh, if you want to go ahead and ask away for Dr. Paul Elliott Hughes, our orthopedic surgeon in Northern California, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, doc, I think we're starting, there we go, there's Dr. Hughes. So Dr. Hughes is from San Mateo, and he's been doing, got his MD at Hughes Orthopedics since 2004, operation access of San Mateo in the Bay Area. He's highly experienced in PRP, which a lot of people are doing right now for uh, stem cell treatment. That's been helpful for a lot of people I hear. Um, and he served as a team physician for the St. Louis Rams. So Dr. Elliot, Dr. Elliot Hughes, Paul Elliot Hughes, um, and the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team and the St. Louis Blues hockey team. You don't like sports at all, right, Dr. Hughes? I like them less with COVID. <laughs> yeah, they really killed our baseball game here. Um, and I, I can't imagine what football is going to be like without like being able to go to a game. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. So, Dr. Hughes, we got your beautiful voice. We don't have your you here with us uh in video but next time um and so we send you tell us when we would send a client to you and send us tell us when that's appropriate well any muscle the orthopedic surgeons are, are the musculoskeletal primary care so in a way i mean even non-operative cases we're used to seeing and making a determination of whether surgery is an appropriate treatment choice um but any real musculoskeletal problem can be referred to an orthopedic surgeon. We're very well trained to take that case. And a lot of the time, they'll determine where the patient needs to go, whether it's a spine surgeon or a pain management doctor for injections of the spine. Or I do a lot of injections myself with either biologics, PRP. I do stem cells, but also cortisone is the mainstay of the pr first injection you usually do for an extremity that's hurt. So again, you mostly though deal with extremities, correct? Correct. So if you were to tell us a normal auto auto uh, rear end collision, is there an extremity that we should maybe say is maybe the most commonly seen or is it often the most common extremity would be the knee. I mean, a lot of knee pain and 
with injuries, it depends on the mechanism. And, and for auto accidents, obviously the spine and neck are going to be the primary injuries you're going to see with auto accidents and belted passengers or drivers. But we should be sensitive. Is there a right or left knee preference in terms of um, you see one more often than the other? The right or left knee? Correct. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, for an auto accident, I've seen a lot of people injure the right side because that's the side that goes on the brake or they brace with the right. Um, I've seen that recently with a meniscus tear. Um, so, so I mean, when we find a client, so we have a client that's for complaining of some knee pain. It's not been um, fixed or has it been addressed or resolved rather in chiropractic care, or even if it has, we should send them to you. What happens or what can you do for someone that has knee pain that's not resolving um, with time? The, the, well, I just had a recent case that's interesting. He went to chiropractic care for a couple months and then we got an MRI and he had a bucket handle meniscus tear, which is basically a surgical case. So in some ways I prefer, whether I've ordered the MRI or someone else has. I think in a lot of these med legal cases, it's important to get a, an MRI or at least an X-ray to make sure you know the pathology before a lot of the treatments are implemented. That's an important point, right? Because we don't want to be sending them, one, we don't want to be complicating the issue by not addressing it, and number two, we don't want to be treating something that may be a surgical, right? Uh, yeah, and, and I think with all the, you know, the connections and a lot of the MRI facilities are, will take liens, and I think it's pretty easy to get that study, um, whether it's the neck, the cervical spine, the lumbar spine, or the extremity. Now, I read recently that the wrist is one of the more commonly injured uh, places after any sort of auto accident. Do you see a lot of wrist injuries? I've seen a few, and a lot of the times you can get some cartilage tears that are pretty subtle in the wrist, and uh, it's not necessarily surgical, but sometimes just giving a simple cortisone injection can really resolve a lot of these pains. So is there something we should, you said that, you know, we should get these MRIs maybe early on these on cases and then get them either to you before or after, but get the MRI studies early. Um, do you prefer that they see you before they see spine? before they see Dr. Light and Dr. Lowe, um, or do you, does it matter, just get them in? I don't think it matters. I think those two doctors would like me because I'll refer them very quickly to them with already teed up for whatever treatment they're gonna do. I love it. So, and then next we have Dr. Lowe. Um, I think his picture is gonna pop up right now, but he's on, I think on everybody's right side of the screen. There, Dr. Lowe, you are in Los Altos, but I know you spend a lot of time in San Francisco. You have two two dogs, three dogs. I can't three remember. dogs. Three dogs who travel with you and are really yeah. cute little guys. Are they there right now? There's no, one of them right here. There you go. We got a Maltese He's right here. Next to me, but sleeping. I, I had dinner with that one. Um, so uh, um, Dr. Lowe uh, spends a lot of time in San Francisco on the weekends, but he's in San Jose. Um, I wish he were in San Jose, San Francisco, and Los Angeles all at the same time, but we've only got one Dr. Lowe. You're doing a lot of work with uh, so with TBI too. You've got a TBI team there at your office too, right? Yeah, not inside of my office. We have a separate center of a facility which was almost on the cusp of, of, of being completely built out. Uh, then obviously when the pandemic uh, came, the, the build out got, got halted. And so we're, we're kind of resuming things slowly right now as we can and, and hopefully you know, next month or so we'll be, we'll be ready to go. But uh, our team, they are seeing patients virtually right now. A lot of the consults, especially by the neurologists, are done virtually. But the, the actual facility with all the testing and the treatment and the rehab um, obviously can't be done right now on, on, on a broad spectrum, but we'll be hopefully open soon. And you guys will be doing VNG testing up there at that center as well, right? We'll have VNG, we'll have posturograms, we'll actually also have EEGs. Um, so quite a bit of testing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you guys don't know about VNG already, you definitely should. We'll definitely get you on here to talk about VNG. I know we're not here to talk TBI today. I naturally have an inclination to want to go talk TBI, but um, do you want to just give like a two sentence explanation of what VNG is so that um, those that are listening can understand that? Sure, I'm mean, just to qualify, I am no expert in, in VNG or, or, or neurodiagnostic testing, but basically it's a, it's a way to measure eye movements. 
that correlates with specific types of brain injury. So, you know, the way that people are able to track movements by looking at them can be measured and monitored and how they track those movements is basically measured with a VNG device. Um, it's, it's good for both diagnoses of, of brain injury, but more so for measurement of prognosis of treatment and for improvement of care and or lack of improvement, right? So if we track it serially over time, you know, we can monitor how the progression is of that disease state as it pertains to the, the, the tracking and the movement of the eyes. Um, we've done it in the past, and I think hopefully Eric will set it up again, where you know, our specialist who conducts the test will actually show videos of what it looks like when people truly have a positive test and how it improves in time. So hopefully at a future future webinar, we can we can show that off. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, and what I say about VNG, just because I don't have um, all the years of medical training that you do, Dr. Liu, but when you go to, when we look at mild TBIs, really, right? And you know we've always looked at imaging, and we've always struggled with finding good imaging, that modern imaging that's readily available that can show evidence of brain damage following a mild TBI. Um, and understanding that we hate the word mild and blah blah blah, but we use it, right? And so when there's these, you know, when someone doesn't have a, you know, a pull through their head or something like that, we've got these other injuries where there's, you know, a soft tissue injury, but we've got some evidence of damage to their brain. Um, you can send them for VNG testing. It's you can't fake it. There's no way I can like make my right eye move a micro millimeter to the left every time you know I track some certain way. You can't. I can't do that. I can't fake that. And so it's a readily available objective test of mild TBI that is available and can show you evidence of brain damage in these mild TBI cases. And so if you're not already in your office using VNG, you absolutely should. And one day you can go do it at one of Dr. Lowe's clinics, one day. You're dead on about that. The, the, the key is that it's an objective test, right? It, and it can't be faked. And, and most of our text, tests are, are objective. I think the key, even rather than, than, than associating with mild TBI, is every test that we utilize looks at a different part of the brain. When you're looking at the vestibular system, if you're looking using an EEG, you look at general waveforms, there's specific areas of the brain we're looking at. And even the, you know, the, the 3T brain MRI, sort of the gold standard that we all use in, with our injured patients um, with neuroquant and DTI, they're looking at specific areas of the brain when they have these, you know, these findings that we all hear about, the, the nonspecific white matter changes on T2 and flare imaging, right? Which, which are generally nonspecific, but do indicate the, the potential for, for, for brain injury. So rather than looking at a thing mild, moderate, severe, um, it really looks at different parts of the brain. And you may have, with different mechanisms of, of the accident, different areas of the brain that are affected. And even if a VNG is negative or the, the, the brain MRI is negative, there may be another area of brain that's affected. And the more tests we have available at our disposal to identify those, uh, sort of the better we are and really truly able to prove that the, the TBI exists. But that all starts with the the history and the physical, right? And and that's where our neurologist is an expert. She is trained in head injury. She is trained in headache, and she knows what to order. It's, she she doesn't order you know blanket every test on everybody. She really knows how to direct the test. Um, you know from the test we talked about the cognitive test and things like that. But we'll get into it later. I know it's, it's off subject, but I mean there's there's I can go on for hours about this. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's really exciting. And if you guys don't already know about it, I promise you we're going to talk about it because it's really exciting. But I think it is it's, it is on topic because it's something that happens in these auto v. auto collisions. So for that, it's relevant. But let's talk about what you really do for our clients. Um, <laughs> that was a little, like you said, off subject, but really important to talk about, I think. Um, so a lot of times our clients have spine pain, a lot of spine pain. And we don't immediately go like, hey, you have pain and we're going to just like, slice you open and see what's going on. We start and we go down sort of another, we go through a path that's a little bit more um, conservative, right? And so one of the things you're able to do for our clients is provide injections for these pains. Can you explain what an epidural actually is and what it does for us? So epidural is one type of injection that we do, and, and there's quite a bit, and, and I apologize again to go off a little subject, but I think really what we do and I think uh, Dr. Hughes used that term, is we really are the quarterback of the personal injury case, right? And much like a primary care would be the quarterback of, you know, your overall care, I, I think the pain specialist, um, and I'm biased, should really see the patient up front and early because we can determine whether there is a, you know, neurologic 
emergency that needs to go to somebody like Dr. Light immediately, or you know, potentially a risk of a joint that needs to go to Dr. Hughes immediately, rather than perhaps if the patient originated with, say, conservative care, which I know the, the dogmas start with conservative and move on. But if we do that every time, sometimes we do a disservice to the patient because sometimes they have more serious injury that needs to be addressed that cannot be addressed or potentially made worse by avoiding you know, the, the, the specialist first and, and, and going through physical therapy or chiropractic. So really, I think that's where we are benefit, right? I mean, we are trained to do minimally invasive interventions on spine and sometimes joint, uh, but we're also trained to evaluate the patient in whole and determine what's necessary. And so I really like to see the patient first, even before they see chiropractor or physical therapy, because I can determine, is this likely soft tissue, in which case we start with more conservative route and don't even necessarily get a MRI, you know, up front. Sometimes we'll get x-rays to, to help the chiropractor with, with alignment and, and how to treat them. Um, or if the patient comes in and has, you know, frank neurologic deficits, weakness, numbness, you know, loss of control of bowel bladder, you know, that patient needs to see Dr. Light yesterday, right, and not spend six to eight weeks longer with, you know, conservative care. So I think that's really where we come of, you know, we are a benefit to, you know, the patient first and foremost for their care, uh, but also to, to, to the entire team, right? We, we don't neglect things that are, are important. Um, getting back to your question about, an ep oh, did you want to ask something? Yeah, no, one point I wanted to make to those listening is I think that when we allow our pain management doctor to quarterback this, another benefit is usually I found that pain management doctor's offices are better equipped to handle maybe like some volume that comes from offices where Dr. Light might not appreciate that we send, you know, that there's just all these people just coming in and we don't know if they're surgical and we don't know what they need and we don't really know anything where you're maybe a little bit more um, equipped and ready to handle, like, let me look at the whole body for a second. Let me see what's really going on. Let me see who he needs to go to. Let's get those MRIs in. And you're, you're really equipped to handle that quarterbacking where sometimes some orthopedic uh, doctors or spine, surgeons rather, I should say, are not um, not readily not ready to handle that volume. Maybe that comes in sometimes. Yeah, I think I think with what we do by nature. I mean, obviously, not to, to, to say less about what Dr. Light does. I mean, he's doing incredible stuff that I couldn't even fathom doing. Um, oh, and he's, he's in the open show. Us. Room. It's incredible what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you know, obviously, a lot of what we do is is we manage. You know the patient in the clinic setting and, and direct a lot of the care, much like, you know, the primary care physician would. Um, but, uh, I mean, if you want, I can go into the epidural, as you, as you yeah, asked initially. Tell us a little bit so we can understand what that, Dr. Light's going to show us a surgery in a second. If you can explain sure. what actually happens, how it's working, so that we can better explain that to our clients, or even understand for ourselves what's going on, that would be helpful. Sure. So, I mean, epidural is one procedure that we do, right? And, and epidural basically means the space that surrounds the, the spinal sac, epi surrounding, and then dura being the, the spinal sac. And when we do an injection, basically what we're doing is we're using a, a, a image-guided system to inject typically a cortisone, an anti-inflammatory medicine, although we can inject biologics, be it stem cells and PRP, you know, A2M, whatever the case is. But basically we're injecting some type of um, medication or substance to decrease an inflammatory reaction. So most of the times when we have a disbulge, disc herniation, right, just to understand what the, what the mechanism of the actual injury is and the, and the pain mechanism, you have two things going on at large, you know. One is the disc bulge itself, right, causing pressure on a nerve, and that can cause pain, numbness, tingling, weakness, everything that we see with our patients. But it also causes an acute inflammatory reaction, which is our body's own defense mechanism, right? That inflammatory reaction is noxious to the nerve and does incite pain, but it also increases the amount of pressure because of the inflammatory reaction itself around that nerve, thereby exacerbating the effects of that disc bulge. So when we inject a anti-inflammatory medicine like a steroid, we're trying to decrease that inflammatory response. Now, my injections don't typically reduce the size of a disc bulge. That, that's, that's usually something that Dr. Light would have to do. But what we try to do is decrease that inflammatory response so that the cascade and the sequela of that injury does not manifest into, you know, long-term <clears throat> malalignment, you know, uh, exacerbation of other areas that, that will start to hurt, you know, other areas along the spine, be it the facet joints and or the soft tissue, the musculature. If we let pain go unchecked, right, the body tries to accommodate that, accommodate that pain, but it doesn't do it in a constructive way because you're hurting. 
we're trying to break that cycle early with that injection, right? And so that's really the goal of that. You know, if that is something that you know can reduce the pain enough that the patient is able to then you know engage in things like core strengthening and physical therapy, they may be able to live in the presence of that bulge, independent of how much compression there is. If they're not, you know, then that's when they need to see somebody like Dr. Light. And sometimes people have more than one injection, one epidural. We'll talk about epidural specifically. What, why does that happen and why is that necessary? All right. Well, I can tell you why it happens with us. It, it doesn't always happen for the right reason. But, you know, when you have multiple epidurals, first, when I do an injection, I never inject unless I am happy and comfortable with how the medicine has spread. Everything that I do is imaged. I can see the med I can see the needle going in, I can see the contrast spreading, I can see the medicine flowing. So if I'm happy with that spread and the patient says I had zero relief, I won't repeat that same injection, right? It wouldn't make sense. Then I have to come back and reassess the patient. Did I potentially miss the diagnosis? Because oftentimes there's not just one injury. If the disc is injured and moved, the translation of that force is through the entire spine from the skin, the muscles, the facet joints, the disc, everything's involved, right? So perhaps the injuries or the, the cause of the pain is multifactorial and, and greater in an area that wasn't where I injected. So if I repeat an injection, you know, usually I'll repeat it if the patient has no response and then I repeat it at a different area, either a different level or a different type of injection, or sometimes the patient has partial response, right? And so with a partial response, Either the inflammatory component only makes up a certain percentage of the pain and the rest of the compression that we talked about, or sometimes there's a lot of when we inject the medicine, the medicine kind of flows past the least resistance. And if the pressure is high in the area of the disc bulge and the nerve compression, sometimes the medicine only partially penetrates and reduces the inflammatory reaction partially. And we come back and repeat an injection when there's less barrier to flow. Second, sometimes the second injection works better because there was less barrier to flow after the initial dose. Um, you know, that's nothing I can prove because you can't really measure the amount of inflammation, but anecdotally, that's what I've seen. If I repeat the same injection and I see the exact same dye spread on both injections, but the second one helps significantly more, that's just sort of what I'm guessing happens and, and it makes sense to me. Um, but, th but those are some of the reasons why we may repeat an injection. Um, you know, I don't routinely schedule a patient for three injections on day one, it, it makes no sense, right? So, you know, I, I always like to do one and then have them come back in for follow-up, which is important. You know, I think we run into problems if you get doctors who schedule for three injections off the bat, there's no follow-up or they see they follow up by a nurse practitioner who's not trained to make the assessment about how well it helped and whether the, the pain is actually coming from a, a different source or multifactorial and something else needs to be addressed. So I always do one and I need the patient to come back and follow up before I, I do another injection so I can truly assess what needs to be done next. Now, some people have relief for like a day, a week, some people a month, some people forever, like indefinitely. Um, what makes that determination? Is there something you can explain to us there? You can't determine it upfront. Now you can guess. If somebody has no relief, either you've missed the spot, diagnosed it wrong, or the problem is not inflammatory. And it's, you know, let's say that you have a, an, an L5, you know, S1 herniation and it's completely obliterating the lateral recess and, and destroying the S1 nerve. And I inject the cortisone there and it does nothing. In that situation, it's not likely I've missed the diagnosis, right? Especially if their symptoms are consistent with an S1 reticular pattern. It's more likely that the compression is so severe that it just didn't help, right? That would, that would, that would be the third example of when an injection doesn't help. Now, why an injection may last one day? Typically when we do an injection, right? We may use some conscious sedation, some medicine through the IV, and some local set. And obviously there's some placebo effects. So one day typically could be one of any of those three. If it lasts, you know, several weeks to a couple of months, but doesn't last beyond that, that's most common where we identify that patient's pain as most likely both the inflammatory component as well as the physical compressive component. If every time they receive an injection, they feel good for two months and then the pain comes back, right? That's not a patient that should have injections for the rest of their life. That's a patient that probably should have a discussion with Dr. Light to see whether they can you know, have some sort of surgical decompression. So, you know, the, there's a lot of diagnostic value when we do the injections as well, both in where the pain is and whether the pain is, you know, truly inflammatory or, or it's going to be in need of surgery. So, you know, it, it's helpful, even though we, we may not get, you know, prolonged relief. Um, there, there's no real injection that lasts forever in the sense that, 
you know, you do an injection and the steroid is in the body forever. That just doesn't exist. But you're right. A lot of patients get an injection and don't need it again for years or ever. Um, I think that alludes to what I had mentioned in the, in, in the initial question when you talked about epidurals, where if we interrupt the cascade and they're able to then not have the sequela of, of, of poor compensation, poor body mechanics, you know, poor alignment, sometimes they can then live in the presence of that pain without causing a, a reflur or, or a re-exacerbation of that, of that inflammatory reaction, right, rather than the injection lasting forever. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, now, can you explain to us, I know that there's been a lot of um, talk about spine stimulators and what sure. they do. Tell us what they are and how they work. Sure. I mean, spine, spine stimulators is within a category called neuromodulation. And really, as that sounds, is what we're trying to do in sort of lay terms is we're trying to pull the body's ability to perceive pain. So the easy way that I explain it to patients is that we use electricity, right, to stimulate the nerves that transmit your pain signals to really interrupt your ability to perceive that pain fully. So if you think about a spine injury, say, you know, at, you know, in the lower lumbar spine, those pain signals have to be sent up through the spine and to the brain where they're processed and the patient can experience the pain. Now, we don't have an exact mechanism of action. There's the gate theory. There's a lot of different theories about how it works and, and how it may hyperpolarize nerves to, to shut them down. But basically what, what I explain to patients is that when we put those wires in between where the pain originates in the low lumbar spine and where you perceive the pain up in the brain, and we turn on those electrical signals, we can interrupt the transmission of those signals so that you perceive less pain. The nice thing about this is that for patients who either, you know, have had surgery and, and, and unfortunately did not benefit, or patients who may not be candidate for more invasive surgeries, you know, this is a good option, number one, because it's far less invasive, um, and number two, because there's a trial that's associated with this, meaning the patient is able to test this out for seven days, and the trial doesn't require any more than a needle and a wire. So we can put in the wire percutaneously, meaning through a needle, without any surgery, without cutting, without an incision, and we can place the wire much like a, a pregnant lady in labor gets an epidural placed. We can place a wire in the target areas that we want to stimulate. And then the patient goes home and goes through the regular activities for a week. And they work with our rep from the stimulating company to have it programmed on a daily basis uh, to see whether they can, you know, mask their ability to perceive the pain. And, you know, this is a great option for those people, again, who have either, you know, unfortunately not um, responded to, to, to surgical intervention or who aren't candidates for multiple reasons. So we have some questions that are coming in. Um, what reasons would a defense expert or what reasons does a defense expert disagree with the medical necessity of this of these pain management procedures so when you're in deposition is there something that you're getting hit with most often i i, I wouldn't say i'm getting hit with anything most often and part of it is because I, I think i practice you know ethical standard of care medicine right and, and that's really it you know you have to really be driven as the doctor by <laughs> helping the patient ethics and following standard of care right if you know, these are some of the things that I see because I, I review a lot of cases. So, you know, doctors who on day one see a patient and, and, and likely don't even see them themselves, but have a nurse practitioner or, or physician assistant see the patient, and then the patient gets scheduled for three injections. I mean, that that's a red flag because you have somebody not trained in making the diagnoses for these different um, spinal conditions and then recommending a series of injections that are carried out by a doctor who's never seen the patient, right? So, so things like that, those are, those are the obvious, right? Um, you know, obviously some of the other things that come up are, you know, patients with negative MRIs getting multiple injections. Now, that's not to say the MRI is the end all, be all of all diagnoses. The MRI is limited in what it's looking for and if utilized for its purpose, it's very, very useful. But sometimes we overutilize and over rely on the MRI. There are a lot of spinal conditions that occur that have nothing to, uh, to, to do with what we find on an MRI. Things like, you know, the sacroiliac joint uh, pain, things like facet-related pain, uh, those are not radiographic diagnoses. Um, so, you know, Can when you patients are coming... You said yeah. a facet injury, for example, a facet joint injury is not uh, something you're going to see on a radiological study. So how, just to step out for a second and explain that for one second, why would you not see that on a 
on, on an imaging study and how is that diagnosed? Just so we can pull that out. Sure, well, let's sort of clarify that. It's, it's not that you won't see facets or potentially a facet injury on a radiographic study. We don't make a diagnosis of facet mediated pain on any radiographic imaging, right? So it's a clinical diagnosis, right? So oftentimes patients will have an inflammatory pain in a small joint, right? That's not going to be seen on an MRI. Even if that joint looks normal on MRI, you could still have facet mediated pain. Now, the important thing, going back to what I was saying, is you can't take everybody with a normal, I, normal MRI and back pain and say, that's facet-mediated. I'm going to do, you know, facet injections, three rhizotomies. That kind of stuff can't happen, right? You really have to exclude other potential causes of the pain. Most common, you know, if you have a low back injury with a normal MRI, more, most common, it's going to be a soft tissue injury. And if that patient didn't respond to a adequate trial of, you know, conservative treatment, chiropractic, physical therapy, and that patient continues to have pain that's, you know, worsened with the provocative maneuvers such as extension, rotation, and, and, and things such as that of those joints, right? If they, if, they, if they don't have that, it's probably not facet mediated. But if they've not responded and they have those findings suggestive of facet pain, even the absence of, of, of a positive MRI, um, that that is diagnostic for facet mediated pain and should be addressed. So when we have a different, so th th thank you for that, by the way, and that, so that takes the facet out of that, just so we can make sure we take that and don't talk about that in this conversation. So sometimes I know that we have either an insurance adjuster or defense attorney that says that client didn't need an epidural. What is something you can arm us with as the lawyers on, on the case or the case managers on the case that will that will help us defend um, the existence of the necessity for a sure. injection well, i mean i'll give you the easy what what i would love to have is you know if the patient has disbulge with nerve compression and pain consistent with the location of which nerve is being compressed meaning diagnostic radiculopathy right, and failed conservative treatment, even if the patient doesn't have, you know, severe neurologic loss, right, if the patient has failed conservative treatment, then it's reasonable to proceed with that injection. Uh, and, and that, to me, should be uncontested, you know, as long as they've gone through a reasonable trial of, uh, of conservative treatment. Now, I think where you're asking the question is oftentimes, you know, we may not have the textbook criteria for the epidural injection, which is radiculopathy, right? Now, in those situations, you know, you have to make sure that the patient exhausts all other options, you know, and all of the conservative treatment. And if the patient has, right, then it really comes down to, you know, is the patient believable, right? If the patient is believable and has exhausted all other options and continues to have pain, then you make your best diagnosis for where you think the pain's coming from, and then you address it. Now, it may be an epidural, it may be a facet injection, but in that situation, if the patient has exhausted all conservative treatments and has not responded and continues to have the pain, the only argument from the defense is that somebody's lying or everybody's in on it, and that doesn't make sense to me, right? So, you know, we're treating our patients <clears throat> if they're presenting with complaints and injuries, right? And if we've exhausted all conservative treatments, um, in that situation, I think it's reasonable to proceed with an intervention. And when, you know, I've heard some, I heard this recently, somebody said, well, why did you do an epidural? They didn't have tingling in their fingers. And I was like, wait, wait what? It's such a, it's so outlandish sometimes what, um, what we'll hear from the defense. Is there something that we could maybe, um, is there something that we should be referencing to, or is there something in your report that you would suggest we, we reference to when we have these like sort of outlier sort of arguments that come out very often? Well, I mean, for something as outlandish as what you just said, you know, you could that simply sh show me the show me any set of guidelines which requires tingling in the fingers to do an epidural, right? So there there is no guideline that specifies you have to have that. Now, obviously, what they're referring to, and it just seems like they're uneducated, is that most of the times, most guidelines for interventions, especially epidurals, require some degree of radiculopathy, which includes not just pain but also neurologic findings. In clinical practice, though, you don't always have patients with numbness, tingling, weakness. 
to be honest, the way that I counter that is if a patient has, you know, numbness and weakness of their extremity, I'm typically not making a recommendation for an injection. If they have neurologic loss, I'm calling Dr. Light and say, this patient needs to come in and see you, right? So I want to get to patients before they have those issues, right? So to, to, to require neurologic deficit or loss to do an injection doesn't really make sense to me. Um, if they want to reference guidelines, there, there's a whole host of guidelines that can be used, but they're not really utilized across the board. There's some for, for World Comp, there's some for Medicare guidelines. You know, if you really want to be safe with everything, I think using the gold standard, which would be Medicare guidelines to look at what, you know, injections are, uh, or when injections are authorized, you, you could utilize that. But in practice, we don't, we don't all do that. And, and, and even in Medicare, be, to be honest, in practice, we don't always follow every, all the guidelines because sometimes patients don't present textbook. And that's just the reality, right? So, you know, there has to be some degree of reliance on your, your clinical acumen to, to make a diagnosis. Uh, and then there's the trust between the patient and the, and the doctor to say, look, you may not have the textbook case, but this is where I believe your pain's coming from. This is what I'm recommending. You disclose that to the patient and, and you proceed with the treatment if they, if they agree with that. And that does happen. But, you know, the, if, you, if you want a gold standard um, guideline, you know, I would probably say, look at the Medicare guidelines for when procedures are indicated. So, and, the, and that's when we start talking doctor, sometimes Dr. Light issues, right? Um, but, well, let me get to some of these questions, because I have so many questions for Dr. Light um, in a moment. But, um, so some of these questions are, um, so one time, this is actually, Dr. Choi had a very good question that actually I was thinking the same thing. So when it's not medically necessary, and Dr. Light, I'm going to ask you to comment on this for one second also. Sometimes, like Dr. Lowe says, it's not medically necessary. It's not a uh, textbook as medically necessary, right? The client's having some pain or some issues are happening, but you have to rely on your clinical diagnosis sometimes. Um, when that happens, though, we we the DME is going to say, these things were not medically necessary. Or if um, the injection doesn't work, they're gonna say the injection was never medically necessary, that we should have just sent them to Dr. Light. So Dr. Lowe, how do you, how should we be responding to claims like that? And then I'm gonna to come to you, Dr. Light, in one second for a second piece of that question. I'll be honest, I have a hard time sort of explaining that answer because it really depends on why they're saying, it, 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 I'm trying to think of a scenario where they would say the injections not off, are not indicated, but the patient should see a surgeon, right? That, that seems odd to me. I mean, if they're suggesting that the patient has a condition significant enough to require surgery, um, why would they question the injection? That seems odd. But, but I think going back to sort of my yeah. general rule of thumb is I, I, I practice very, very, what I consider conservative standard of care ethical medicine, right? And, and I hope we all do. And I know that all the doctors in this panel do as well. I've worked with all of them and, and they're fantastic. But, um, you know, again, if I have exhausted all conservative treatments, right, and the patient continues to be suffering, the quality of life, we can document the impact on their life. And by physical exam, we can identify, you know, their limitations and their pain. And we come to a conclusion about where the pain may be coming from. Um, you know, in that situation, I don't really have a hard time making the recommendation for an injection. I mean, they, they'll ask me in, in depositions sometimes, would you have done this for, you know, a patient with Medicare? 100% yes. Would you have done this for a Blue Cross patient? 100% yes. Would you have done this for a pro bono patient? 100% yes, right? I mean, if, if I practice the same way <clears throat> with all of my patients, right, I don't, I feel comfortable with my diagnoses. I don't, I don't over-treat, I don't over-diagnose, but if a patient is suffering and has failed all conservative care and they don't fit in a textbook classic diagnosis, I'm not going to turn them away and say, bye, sorry, you're, you're, you're on your own, figure it out. You know, I'll explain to them, this may not be the classic presentation for what we typically see, but I feel that your pain is still likely coming of this source. This is what I'm recommending. As long as they understand that and they like to proceed, I'll, I'll defend that recommendation. I appreciate that. So here's where the first part, this is where the question is going to go to Dr. Light in a second. So... When a client asks why they should get an epidural because if that because that's temporary or it sometimes is temporary, what should we talk to our client about or how do we um, what should we say in that instance? And then Dr. Light, I'm going to ask you that exact same question. Well, first, <clears throat> thank you for allowing me to be on this presentation. Um, it's so nice to finally see Dr. Lowe because I've spoken to him on the phone many times and we've shared a lot of patients 
but I've never actually seen him before. So uh, I'm really happy to see him. You guys really say. are the tag team of tag teams, though. Like, you guys are an amazing, amazing team to work together. Um, and I'll just, if I can, Dr. Light, just introduce you for one second. Um, so you're the founder of the San Francisco Spine Center. I mean, I think everybody here knows you. We all know you, Dr. Light. You, you are really... Um, I, hope, I hope in a good way. Oh, a fantastic way. You've helped so many people's clients over the years. It's been amazing. You're, so you're the medical director of the Spine Network of California. You did your fellowship. Oh, you did your fellowship up in New York. Is that right? Correct. Wow. President of the Simmons Surgical Society. And you're affiliated with St. Francis Memorial Hospital. Um, but you, so what sometimes our clients say, I am in so much pain. Please help me. They are desperate. They are absolutely desperate for help. And when we talk about going to injection first um, and going through, you know, let's send you the pain management. Let's see what's going on. And Dr. Lowe has to tell them that the epidural is not necessarily going to always be a forever solution or it might be temporary. Um, they call us and they say, I'm in pain. Why am I going to do that? Why am I, why are you making me do this? Just send me to the doctor. And let's just take care of this. Like they're desperate. They're in pain. What should we tell them? What do we say in that instance? I think the, the answer is relatively simple. Uh, I agree with most of the things that Dr. Lowe said. Um, rarely is there an indication not to do an epidural. The indication to do an epidural is failed conservative treatment over a period of, say, 12 weeks, although that's not a hard and fast rule. If a patient has very severe pain, uh, is unable to sleep at night, is taking narcotics, that's a good patient uh, to, to, uh, on which to perform an epidural. Uh, if you can identify where to um, inject or where to inject the medicine. Um, there's two, there are two uh, indications not to do an epidural. One uh, is if a patient has something called cardiquina syndrome. Uh, they're either uh, lost uh, bowel and bladder control or they're unable to urinate or defecate. They have saddle anesthesia. They can't move their legs. That is one of the uh, uh, main surgical indications uh, and to move ahead with surgery right away, not to perform epidurals. And that's a condition called cardiquina syndrome. It's usually caused by a large herniated disc at the L4-5 level. Another indication would be something like an acute uh, myelopathy where the spinal cord is being damaged and uh, you really don't have that much time to wait to see if an epidural would work. There's so much pressure on the spinal cord, it's causing the crosis of the cord, which will mean a permanent neurological deficit. Those are indications, in my opinion, not to do an epidural. The rest, uh, uh, anything to do with pain, on a, in my practice, uh, if a patient has on a scale of zero to 10, uh, pain that's uh, as high as a six or seven, and they've been through conservative treatment, I want those patients to have an epidural. I don't want them to have surgery uh, because uh, uh, in the deposition or in the trial, they're gonna ask me, why didn't you try an epidural? And, and there are certainly cases that I've had pain for uh, three, four, five, six months where they have an epidural. It allows the body to heal whatever damage has occurred and the patient can avoid surgery. And any ethical spinal surgeon uh, would uh, uh, has to treat uh, these conditions conservatively rather than surgically. Surgery always has risks and it's much better for the patient not to have surgery. Although I like to do surgery, uh, the bottom line is I'd rather see the patient get better without having the surgery. I like that answer because I think that's something that we get, we get hit with a lot really often, right? Where the client's like, they're desperate, they're in pain, they want to see you, Dr. Light, but we have to tell them like, let's Go, let's take a little more conservative approach at some, you know, first. And I would, I would prefer that because uh, if the patients have all the conservative treatment that they could have and they still have pain, that's a patient that that uh, likely would need surgery. These other the patients who are going to get going to get better anyway. Uh, I don't want them to have surgery. Yeah, now I can reach it. Now I heard you have a very cool um, procedure to show us. Um, I, 
I can show it to you. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Dr. Light um, has a surgical procedure. I was asking when we were putting this together, I said, you know, it would be really exciting for me to be able to know, um, hear from our doctors when we should see them, have them explain the procedures a little bit. But I really want to see what happens when we actually do these procedures. Dr. Lowe, next time we're coming on, I want you, next time hopefully you could show us an epidural needle and then actually show us how you feed, uh, how you actually inject and what happens there. While he's pulling that up, if we can ask you one question, Dr. Lowe. Um, somebody was asking, how do you monitor the spread of steroids if the patient's allergic to the dye? So there, there's, typically when somebody's allergic to dye, you know, it's, it's an iodine-based allergy. Now, we oftentimes associate iodine-based uh, allergies with a whole host of other allergies like shellfish and seafood, which, which I don't believe is, is truly has a, a scientific correlation. But nevertheless, it's a good question. We do have non-iodinated um, dyes that we use, and, and they're usually some form of MRI contrast, gadolinium and whatnot. Uh, the... the <clears throat> The contrast itself is not as um, as strong as an iodine-based dye, but we can use that in place. Um, so that can be done. We also, you know, depend on you know the, the actual vision and feel as well. So when we're doing procedures, we're image guidance, I suggested, but sometimes we're also depending on feel, like the loss of resistance technique and things like that, that can indicate where we will be. But dye is necessary because we're around the spine and we want to make sure we're not in a blood vessel, right? Intravascular injections can be catastrophic you know, spinal cord strokes, brain strokes, and things like that, seizures and whatnot. So um, great question. We do have non-iodinated uh, contrast materials that we do use on a regular basis. Okay. So thank you for answering that question. Okay, Dr. Light, we're ready. Okay. So I'm going to preface this before I actually show you the surgery uh, by um, the question always comes up, uh, what operation should does the patient need? Do they need a microdiscectomy? Do they need a, a laminectomy? Uh, do they need a spinal fusion? What kind of operation do you use for each type of problem? So the answer to that question uh, it basically depends on the nature of the damage uh, that's that's done to the spine and the nature of the symptoms. This is an example of somebody who was in a rear end collision and, and uh, was seen by me after having an epidural and therapy with pain radiating down the left leg to the outside of the foot, the small toe, uh, and had some weakness in their leg. And here you can see, this is an MRI. This is called the sagittal view. This is the sacrum, which is part of the, the uh, tailbone. And here's the bottom disc, and uh, it's called L5S1 because this is the L5 vertebrae, this is the S1 vertebrae. And here, a piece of the cartilage of the spine, which is the disc, has been retropulsed into the spinal canal and is pinching this particular nerve, which is the S1 nerve root, which we know goes to the outside of the foot and the little toe, also produces the power of the calf muscle. So on the lateral view, we could see this. Uh, on the uh, axial view, we can see this large piece of cartilage which is now compressing the S1 nerve root. This patient has numbness on the outside of the foot, uh, could, not, could not walk on their toe, has an absent Achilles reflex, uh, and comes in with uh, just a complaint of uh, leg pain. This uh, case uh, would respond to something called a microdiscectomy, where a little piece of the, the back of the spine is removed. This fragment is removed, and uh, once the pressure is taken off the nerve, in a majority of cases, the sciatic pain or the pain in the leg resolves. So that would be a laminectomy microdiscectomy. But uh, Dr. Lowe would readily agree, uh, there are a lot of patients who have this operation and either the pain returns a second time or they never get relief. And uh, that happens for two reasons. One is the indication is incorrect. There is not one large fragment pushing on the nerve. Uh, the doctor goes in, makes a hole in a, in a small protrusion. Um, more material leaks out later. There's still irritation of the nerve root, and the patient has ongoing back pain after that. If the patient's symptoms are primarily back pain and secondarily leg pain, removing a small piece of disc within the disc space does not work. And for this reason, uh, uh, surgeons went on and devised various types of operations. Spinal fusions uh, have always been done, 
but there are significant limitations of spinal fusions. It makes a very unnatural uh, situation for the spine. It puts pressure on the adjacent discs. And we all know patients who have ever had spinal fusions who have still have pain. So in 1976, a, uh, the um, Olympic champion, uh, a woman's gymnast by the name of Karen Butner Jans, uh, developed something called a disc replacement. And what it is, it's a prosthetic disc that um, allows the spine to move and not be fused. And it allows complete removal of the disc, uh, removal of all the torn ligaments in the spine, and stabilization of the spine by the insertion of an implant. This is a patient that's uh, just about to have the procedure. Uh, they're lying supine on the operating table. The operation is done through an anterior approach or the abdomen. Uh, this is the patient's belly button and this is their pubic symphysis, and it, it's done through an incision just like this. And what happens is uh, the first uh, structure encountered is the covering to the uh, rectus muscle. This is incised. The muscle is uh, pulled aside, and this is the uh, spinal disc. This is just a marking screw to tell us where the middle of the spine is and what level we're in. This is after the disc is removed, and um, I know it's hard to see, but this kind of uh, glistening structure is the covering of the nerves or the dural sac. And all of this material was removed that was damaged and that was pressing on the dural sac. So there is complete decompression. There is no other disc that remains. And then this little implant, which is uh, a little, uh, really? it, it's like a miniature, it's like a mini miniature hip replacement. And this is a, a, a movable core from the implant. And this is put in to replace the damaged disc. And this can move uh, uh, forward and backward. It allows normal movement of the spine. Here you can see the patient leaning forward. And you can see that these two lines are converging. Here they're leaning backward. And you can see there's, there's uh, this approximates normal movement. It's not perfectly normal movement. And what it does is it prevents collapse of the disc. It allows us to completely decompress the nerves, allows the disc space to be stabilized and preserve the openings in the spine where the nerves uh, 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 come out. And uh, the results are very good. This is an example of a patient. This is Lorraine Correa. She's now a little over two months following a disc replacement at L5S1. Lorraine, uh, tell me. This patient had two microdiscectomies before. She had a disc replacement. Okay. And you have a sciatic pain. No longer. Could you see a metformin test? And this is two months after the disc replacement. And, uh, could I see I don't know of any test? operation that's more successful mm -hmm. than this. Now walk on your heels. In, in back surgery. Could I see a bend down and touch your toes? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Wow. Come on now. And you do strenuous work now? I do. I, uh, what are you able to do now? I can move uh, salt blocks, 50 pound salt blocks for my critters. I can move um, 50 pound bags of feed for chickens and donkeys and goats. Well, I still be careful about that. <laughs> anyway, um, this isn't an advertisement for disc replacement because there are patients that have this and, and you know don't get as good an outcome as we would like. But uh, for patients who have primarily back pain, have a diffuse central herniation of the disc, uh, rather than go through a failed microdiscectomy, this seems to be a little bit better. So there's a disectomy. There's a couple of very common surgeries that you perform, right? Correct. Can you well, tell us what they are and what, so that we understand where this is in the spectrum? Sure. So. Um, the, uh, again, as I showed in the first example, uh, patients who have um, just leg pain and a single, a single what we would call extruded fragment of disc, uh, those patients would have a uh, microdiscectomy or laminectomy and discectomy. Um, patients who have ongoing, okay, so I'm sorry, patients who have ongoing back pain uh, and don't have a, a simple disc extrusion but have ongoing back pain. Their MRI scan shows a degenerative disc. There's a diffuse protrusion of the disc. They can't sit, stand, bend, or walk. They've been through six months of conservative care. They've had epidural injections. They can't work. Uh, they, they're disabled. 
those patients I would like to see have a disc replacement. The alternative to that would be a spinal fusion. The disc replacement takes 12 weeks to heal. The spinal fusion takes over a year to heal. So um, I'm thinking that uh, that that type of person failed conservative treatment, primarily back pain, uh, damaged disc. Um, that would be something that somebody that would have a uh, disc replacement. Okay. So now going back to what you were just showing us, can you go back to that image really quick that you just had up? Uh, if not, I can I can ask you a question. I, it, I can go back without it, actually. Um, so we have a question that just came in that I'll ask you first, and then I'll go back to my scheduled question. What role does obesity play in the facet diagnosis um, when we talk about like obesity versus trauma? And I think we lost Dr. Light. Dr. Lowe, do you want to take that question? And this is why you have a team of doctors, guys, because when one this doctor right. can't answer, you got the other. <laughs> There's a video that Dr. Light sent us um, that they'd like me to play. Is, is now okay. a good time to play it? Let's go ahead and answer this question, and then we'll take it. Okay. Sure. First, Erica, thank you for not having me follow up on one of my videos after that. It would be very anticlimactic looking at one of my videos. <laughs> I told you we're going to do it a different time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to come up with some kind of dance routine to spice it up because it's going to be very, very boring compared to what he did. Um, yeah, that was an awesome show, so I was glad he was able to, to, to show some videos of that. Um, it is really gory. You know, so many times we see we see the imaging all the time in our, in our offices, right? And I forget that sometimes that there's blood and there's like this is tissue and muscles that you're going through and i think that sometimes you don't oh dr light you're back <laughs> um, we forget we're talking about your video and we're saying you know a lot of times you know when a lot of times we get our adjusters our defense lawyers who are saying well they didn't need that procedure they didn't need it that bad or we, they talk about how much pain they're not in how much pain does somebody have to go in to allow you to go in and just start digging into their back and cutting and replacing and things like that or even dr Lowe, who thinks he's anticlimactic with his with his epidurals i mean that needle is like i mean i get upset when they prick my finger at the doctor like you know i'm upset over a paper cut this is some major stuff going on for our clients. And I think it's important to one major takeaway from your video, Dr. Light, was how much actually goes into these surgeries and what you're really doing there. Um, somebody just asked us, so we were going to, uh, we, the question was, what role does obesity play in a facet diagnosis, um, obesity versus trauma? Do you want to take that, Dr. Lowe? And then I have a question for Dr. Light after. Yeah, I mean, if I understand the question correctly, they're saying, how do we diagnose or make a diagnosis of a set related pain in the setting of obesity? I think like any other situation when you have a predisposing factor, right? The diagnosis, number one, is not, uh, can, cannot be ignored in the setting of a predisposing factor such as obesity or if somebody has three existing injuries, right? It's really, the important thing is, is in making the diagnosis and then explaining the, the conditions before the injury, the condition after, the impact on life, the symptomology and how it's different, right? And so obesity or pre-existing condition, it, it, it makes no difference. If, if a patient has clinical facet mediated pain that can be diagnosed and, and, and we can diagnose or we can uh, explain a significant material change um, compared to their pre-accident condition, uh, then you know it's irrelevant. If you're asking me whether things like obesity can predispose people to back conditions, such as facet uh, mediated pain or other conditions, of course the answer is yes. You know, it, it would be foolish to say not, but you know, that that I don't think that's any barrier to making a diagnosis, right? Um, I think the issue is you have a diagnosis and you take your plaintiff as you find them, right? Exactly, right, so. So that's the answer. So um, Dr. Light, before we play the other video you have for us, which I believe is as show-stopping as the first, um, in men, isn't there a risk of nerve injury which can cause impotence by anterior, this anterior approach is someone's question. Excellent question. And the answer is very simply that um, no, it can't cause impotence, but it can cause a condition called retrograde ejaculation. 
And in one or two percent of uh, cases, the approach, the anterior approach to the spine interferes with the uh, fine uh, sympathetic nerves over the uh, spine just by moving them. Uh, they don't function as well. And uh, the patient, when uh, male patients, when they ejaculate, the semen moves up into their bladder rather than comes out the end of their penis. It's not really felt to cause impotence, although people with chronic pain commonly have impotence uh, from another neurological mechanism, meaning, uh, you know, if you're in pain all the time, uh, uh, it's, it's not the easiest thing to get an erection in some cases. I, okay, I didn't I didn't understand that actually before too. So now let's um talk. So thank you for that. Um, we have a video you're gonna show us. Can you tell us what we're about to watch? And this is the end, guys. We're at the very end, but it's a good one. Well, I hope um you are going to show the video because um it is a YouTube video that your assistant downloaded or has the link to on your end of the webinar. So. Uh, uh, what are I think gonna watch? Have... What is it? Okay. So basically, uh, I had the good fortune of being on one of uh, uh, the, the medical show called The Doctors, and I had a patient who had chronic pain. Uh, she happened to be a grave digger, a woman grave digger, who was uh, mowing the um, the lawn of the of the cemetery and fell uh, over the uh, handle of the lawnmower onto her head and suffered an injury to the one of the cervical discs. Oh wow! Wow. Okay, so gonna, let's take a look. Play. There you go. It's on a hillside, and I was mowing it up a plot, and I was walking the mower down to the stairs, and the mower just it took off on me, and I flipped over the handles of the mower and I hit the back of my head. I don't think I've ever hit my head that hard. It really scared me. When I went to the doctor, I got an MRI and it showed a herniated disc in my neck. I wake up with headaches every day. It gets so bad, it's like I can hear my, my pulse in my ear. I've tried medication. I've gone to the hospital five times because of pain. I really feel that it's got to a point that I can't take it anymore. So I'm going in tomorrow to have a total disc replacement done. Well, well let's see how Chandra's spine surgery went. What you've done is um, you've injured the C56 disc, just pinching the spinal cord right here. So we'll be removing all of this material and replacing it with this replacement in place. Mm -hmm. Get the show on the road, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where we're going to make the incision is just below the atom down. We're going right in front of the right artery and that leads us right down to the spine. Mm -hmm. We're right on the spine. This white glistening structure is the front of the disc. Now we're going to incise the disc. This is the disc material here, the white cartilage. Now I've removed the entire front of the disc. You're going to use a microscope and pull the material off of the front cord. This is a delicate part. Well, I can see the piece sitting right in front of the spinal cord right now. This is the piece of disc that was pressing on the spinal cord. This is the, the disc face. Now has no more disc in it. We're ready to put the implant in. This is the implant. We're just going to gently tap the implant into place. This is the C5, C6 disc, the artificial disc replacement in the uh, disc space. Uh, you can see that it's aligned perfectly in the center of the disc space. It's just going to function very well. I'm here with spinal surgeon Dr. Kenneth White in the San Francisco Spine Center, along with his patient, Chandra. Wow, that's very cool. Dr. Light, we got to get you on to show us some more of these procedures. I'm really excited to see how these procedures are actually done. It's interesting. You know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos and other, I've gone to a lot of trainings on these procedures. But it's different when you're walking us through, I guess maybe because we know you, um, but you're walking us through this. Um, and a woman grave digger, wow.
Why not? Cool. <laughs> so Dr. Lowe will be back for the ultra exciting, uh, you know, go back into our um, going in and understanding epidurals sooner than later. I think we'll have that scheduled. Uh, Dr. Light, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was a really, uh, watching these procedures is really interesting, but also it brings us back to remembering what we're doing, who we're helping, and what our clients are actually going through, that they're in so much pain that that is better than the life that they're leading right now. Um, I think that's the part that we have to remember, that having someone dig and cut and do all of those things is better than continuing to live with the pain that they're experiencing day to day and remembering to show that. Um, so if people want to watch that full video that we just saw from Dr. Light, you can go, I think Chenny just saved, saved that in chat for everyone. Um, I think we have some other questions that have come in. Chenny, there's some other questions. Maybe what we can do is save those for next time. Is that okay? I think that's a great idea. These webinars seem to be in demand. <laughs> so we'll save that for next time. Um, and then we'll see everybody um, tomorrow, I guess, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at TBI Med Legal. Uh, we have, we're learning how to read medical reports so that we're better um, lawyers and case managers for Dr. Lowe and Dr. Light um, and Dr. Hughes. I think he had to leave really quickly. So we got him in quickly and got him back to the surgery room. Um, well, I'm here still. You're here. Oh my gosh. I thought you had to leave us. So I just like got you in. Uh, to be honest with you, I did a surgery while you guys were talking. I listened the whole time. Wow, you're <laughs> quick. <laughs> Can you tell us what you did? I did a partial meniscectomy. They okay, usually take about that? 10 minutes. Not not big deal. Can you tell us what that means and what you just did? It means that That's there was a meniscus tear and I did an arthroscopy with a camera and went in the joint and smoothed out the cartilage. And what does that do for the person in pain? It gets rid of their knee pain if they have a meniscus tear. And then they like me a lot. <laughs> so what happens, I just read a report the other day, I have to ask you this. I read a report where um, it said that our client has gone on with two years, so much pain, that now they are quote unquote bone on bone. What happens in that situation when we read that diagnosis? Well, when we that's an arthritic knee and there's many options that we can do for that, including shots. I like to do biologics before knee replacements now. I think there's too many knee replacements done in this country. I think there's other options that need to be looked at before. But you know, you have, you, you have to see the doctor and talk about the problem and then go forward with a, a, a treatment plan. And this is why we need a very good team that will have a holistic approach. If you're not already bringing pain, spine, and extremities together on your cases, as you can see today, the way that you guys worked beautifully together and apparently did a procedure during a webinar, how cool would that have been to put, throw like a GoPro on you though, uh, Dr. Hughes? Uh, maybe next time, right? We can have big wishes, right? <laughs> Last we'll time I tried to do a GoPro, I messed it up. Uh-oh. Okay, we'll try We'll try something else. We'll need Chenny to give us some uh, audiovisual advice on that. We definitely. Chenny, we're going to come back to you because uh, we got to do these things. Apparently, you're doing these things live now on webinar. Uh, but uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tomorrow. We're going to learn how to read our medical reports and then at TBI Med Legal. And then on Thursday, what are we doing on Thursday? I um, can't remember what Thursday is, but I can tell you Friday is like the ultimate TBI guide. We're learning. Um, we're starting from a case um, and we're going to talk about you get the case first day in the door here's all the kinds of symptoms that can exist here's all the different complications that can exist and we're going to talk about how to identify each one how to um, diagnose it and then how to actually treat it so that you can actually identify the deficit that it's causing um, Dr. Lowe, we had one quick question that I don't know if you can answer for us. People are asking when they can do a VNG procedure. And then Dr. Hughes, I have a question for you on the out as well. When logistically in my in my center, or are they talking about in general for a case? Let's say both, because they didn't specify in their question. Logistically for a center, hopefully we'll have doors open within a month or so. But but again, we're sort of dependent on you know the, the direction of this pandemic um, because so much of our treatment is is, is relying on repeated multiple visits with multiple people in, in at the same time. Um, you know, as far as when a VNG is indicated, I think it really, you know, we, I, I leave that to be honest up to my, my neurologist, right? If, if, there, if there's signs of, you know, vestibular impact, right, or, or, or injury such as, you know, 
busyness, balance, yeah, difficulty with coordination, right? You know, I, I think that, that that's important, again, not just to make the diagnosis, because the diagnosis can truly be made clinically, but you really want to monitor the, the progression and or regression of symptoms, you know, as treatment as treatment goes on. Um, so, you know, in those situations, the, the earlier the better, because it's a really good tool for, for monitoring, right? So, you know, our, our, our neurologist is phenomenal at, um, you know, utilizing those tools when indicated and and can very easily defend that in any situation. I, um, I love that. That's great. So we can, we really need a, it's a case by case basis, um, Jeff. I think that's what we're, what we're saying um, here. But when you do have a client that does have balance, you can definitely get them to the neurologist quickly so that we can get them to usually ENT or somebody who can um, have the BNT for us or for that. Um, and Dr. Light, there was one last question that I think we did not get to. Somebody asked us the difference between, if you can give this to us quickly on the out, what is the difference between a herniation, a disc bulge, and a disc bulge? That's fantastic because um, the bottom line is <clears throat> they're all the same. They're all forms of herniated discs. Uh, so uh, disc bulge is really a non-scientific term, but anytime the nucleus of the disc migrates into an abnormal position within the disc space, that is by definition a type of herniated disc. A Can disc I for one second disc before you go ahead. Think jelly donut, which I don't like jelly donut because it's not as it's not the right um, consistency. But if you think jelly donut, anytime that the jelly gets out of the donut, that's the way I always used to think about it. Well, th that's a good analogy, but you're absolutely right. When most people have herniated discs, the jelly uh, turns into something like mozzarella cheese rather than actual jelly. <laughs> so. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and then uh, so okay, so then you were going to keep going. Sorry about that. I just wanted um, to give a disc protrusion is a type of a herniated disc where the covering of the disc is stretched and torn, but the essential covering is still present. So that's a disc protrusion. A disc extrusion is when the annulus of the disc is completely torn and the pizza mozzarella cheese or crab meat or whatever kind of food you like migrates into the spinal canal and is resting on the nerve. So it's commonly, a disc protrusion is commonly called a contained herniation. I'd like to see them get rid of the word bulge because it has no scientific value. A bulging disc actually can be a perfectly normal disc. So it, it's a non-scientific term that I think shouldn't be used. We'll definitely be talking about that tomorrow, but that's definitely, I agree with you. We need to get rid of that term for sure. We should stop using it. Anyways, guys, it's been amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Dr. Hughes, what a master. Surgery and webinar at the same time. That was pretty cool. And doc, so Dr. Lowe, Dr. Hughes, um, Dr. Light, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to next time. Um, if you are not using the three guys, you should definitely give them a call, give them, um, talk to them. Their offices are all amazing. Doctors are really responsive. And thank you guys for sharing your time with us and sharing your Tuesday with us. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you thank next you. week. And Dr. Lowe, we thank gotta you. we're gonna make you really yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Sounds good. Oh Bye, wait, everybody. You ask me what your dog's name is. Oh, so I have I have I have a couple. So the one that I showed you was Baba and she's she's always right next to me. That's this little one. And then I've got Yoda which is running around the office right now. He's a miniature golden doodle. And then I've got the corgi at home called Ace. There so we this go. is Bao Bao. Bao Bao in Chinese means is how little kids ask to be hugged. They say Bao Bao, and that's her name. Oh, she's very loving. On that, guys, we'll see you everybody tomorrow. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>